Okay, so that's our second block of lectures on SMP solving with Elizabeth Paulgin and the speaker. So thanks a lot for coming and giving the course of lectures. Welcome. All right. Okay. I'm just going to give it 30 yes. seconds for people to sit down. Cool. Okay, so this is going to be a very different style of lecture. Um, I'm going to tell you, basically, by the end of this lecture, I want, or the end of the two lectures, I want you to be able to go away and use SAT and SMT solvers in your research for problems that you care about. And I'm going to make the bold claim that for like, I don't know, at least 90% of you in this room, there is going to be something in your research that you could use a SAT or an SMT solver for. So, can I change slides? Oh no, don't die, don't stop. Yeah, it's on. Um, that's fine, we can do it like this. Okay, so. By the end of these lectures, you're going to know what Boolean satisfiability is. You're going to know how to encode problems into SAT and into SMT, which is satisfiability with theories. You're going to know some of the solvers that are available, how to use them. And you're also going to know some useful tools for generating SAT and SMT queries if you don't want to sort of do it by hand from scratch. And you're going to have some examples of how these might deploy, be deployed in the wild. You will not know, unless you already know it, I'm not extracting information from your head, you will not know the details of how SAT and SMT solvers work. You will have a high level overview, but I mean, honestly, it would be an entire, it would be like a two semester course for me to tell you how SMT solvers work from the ground up. And as a bonus, um, if we get time, one of the applications of SMT solvers that I'm going to talk about is going to be how to synthesize code. Like you must be bored of writing code, right? No one likes writing code. What if we could write it for you? So we're going to do a little bit on program synthesis if there's time. Uh, okay, so who am I? Why am I qualified to be talking about any of this? Um, I am a lecturer in LFCS at Edinburgh. Uh, that doesn't really tell you why I'm qualified to talk about SAT and SMT solvers. Uh, but basically all of my research uses SAT and SMT solvers in some way. Uh, and I also build synthesis algorithms, which as we will hopefully see are basically just a collection of SMT solvers working together. Um, and there are, okay, so I'm the main maintainer of the Euclid 5 tool, which is sort of a modeling framework that allows you to build models in its language and then deploy verification and synthesis queries to SMT solvers. Um, and I've also done a bunch of stuff with CBMC, which is a bounded model checker for C programs, which spits everything out to a SAT solver at the back end. Um, so I would say I'm pretty good by now at using SAT and SMT solvers. It's my thing. Um, but I haven't actually told you what this is. So, okay, what is SAT? We're talking about Boolean satisfiability. Um, this is just the high level get us on the same page slide. Uh, so we have a formula which is only using Booleans and like connected so we've got and we've got negation we've got or and the satisfiability problem is find me a value to the boolean variables find me an assignment to the boolean variables such that this evaluates to true uh, i've given you the answer and uh, maybe i should have left the answer off and made you give me the answer smt um adds a theory to that so smt set and a theory is something like integers reals floating points but basically it's the same problem i've given you a formula find me an assignment to any free variables that makes it true 
Um, yeah. Oh, I should also say there is a GitHub. I've made a I've made a I've made a GitHub repo for this for these lectures. If you go on that GitHub repo, you will find the slides, which may or may not be precisely the slides I'm presenting from, but I'll update it once I'm done. And you will also find every example that I'm using and links to every tool that I will use during the lectures. And I, I plan to go at a pace that you could run these things along with me if you wanted, but equally, um, they're just there so that afterwards you can go and take a closer look at them. Uh, you don't need to start installing stuff now though, there are not many examples in the first 45 minutes. Uh, so, uh, this is this is a school on programming languages and verification. Why are we talking about SAT and SMT? Why are they important? They are used in so many different verification tools. So I'm going to give you my perspective on on where verification tools sort of fall, and I'm going to do it showing this pyramid. But uh, let me first let me first tell you where this pyramid comes from. So um, the pyramid is going to come back in a couple of slides, by the way. So I'm going to give you, so this is, this is work I've, I'm doing with Martin Brain. The pyramid comes with full credit to Martin Brain. Your ideal verification tool never misses a bug, never gives a false alarm, and it's fully automated for all specifications and all programs. So that's where this pyramid comes from. Um, so we've got we've got a sideline which is no missed bugs. We've got a we've got a side which is no false alarms. And we've got a side that is fully automatic. And the reason the tools are all on the corners and not at the top, it's impossible to have the perfect tool. We cannot have the perfect verification tool of my dreams. The reason we can't have the perfect verification tool of my dreams is because. So my perfect tool, if it never misses a bug and never gives a false alarm and is fully automated for all specifications and all programs, it's got to solve the halting problem. Like, like what if my specification is, does this program terminate? So we can't have all of them, but we can have two out of three and two out of three ain't bad. And let me tell you how you can have two out of three. Uh, so it never misses a bug and is fully automated. Um, I can really trivially give you this. There are obviously better examples, um, but I can write a script that just says your program is wrong. Never going to miss a bug. Never gives a false alarm and it's fully automated. I can write a script that just says your program's great. Um, and never misses a bug and never gives a false alarm, but we don't care about automation. I'm just going to write a script that says work it out yourself. So we can have two out of three. But this is how I've put things on this verification pyramid. Um, so you can see there's this sort of range of tools that we've, you're probably familiar with some and not familiar with others. So instead of our testing and symbolic execution, so we have things like CLI, have model checking, have CBMC that we're going to talk about, deductive verification, sort of including things like COC in this sort of theorem prover type things. Functional verification, I'm saying this is pre and post conditions, things like Spark, abstract interpretation, and static analysis, I'm saying is things like Haverity, things that do sort of pattern matching. But what do they all have in common? They all have SMT solvers or SAT solvers underneath them, or almost all. Or at least one tool in each corner has an SMT solver or a SAT solver under it. Um, so. CBMC and CLI both chuck out stuff to SAT solvers. Um, Coverity, um, if, so if your patterns get, so in some cases, your static analysis will start using SAT solvers and SMT solvers. And in some cases, your abstract interpreters will start using SMT solvers. Uh, Spark, so this sort of pre and post condition, that sort of naturally gets chucked out to an SMT solver quite a lot of the time. And I'm not going to claim to be any kind of expert in deductive verification, but there are definitely cases where you start deploying an SMT solver. I see that these things are mostly in our top right under approximative corner, but they are ubiquitous across verification. So you should care, is what I'm saying. Um, so 
I've given you an informal definition of propositional sat. I'm putting I'm putting a formal definition up here. Um, essentially, we have Boolean variables and we have negation, disjunction, conjunction, and implication. I am going to try and be consistent with my symbols, but you will see you'll see other symbols, particularly if you start heading off to Wikipedia. I also haven't included the most the most confusing symbols, which is if you talk to people in electronic engineering, which I mean, my background, I come from electronics, um, you will find that they start doing confusing things with a plus and a dot where they really don't mean what you think. Uh, so plus is or and dot becomes and, and that blows my mind every time I try and read it. Trying to try and stick with the V and the wedge. Okay, some definitions. Um, when I say that a formula is satisfiable, I mean you can give me an assignment to the variables such that the formula evaluates to true. When I say that the formula is unsatisfiable, I mean that it evaluates to false for all possible assignments to the variables. And when I say that the formula is valid, it means it evaluates to true for all assignments to the variables. We don't very often use valid, but because it's often easier just to check that it's not unsatisfiable. But um, yeah, valid, you will sometimes hear. So uh, yeah, essentially our problem is given this formula, find 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 an assignment to our variables such that f is such that f is true and if so we want you to return those assignments once you return those values um, i'm going to give you another another reason you should care um it is sat is like the canonical np complete problem um if you can reduce a problem to sat the problem is in np um including Mario, if you go on the GitHub and get these slides, that Mario picture is a link that will take you to a YouTube video um, where a man explains why Mario is NP hard. And we're not gonna watch it because it's a long video and it's quite confusing, but Mario is NP hard. Uh, but despite being, despite being NP complete, so there, there isn't a polynomial time algorithm for solving SAT, We are still unreasonably good, or SAT solvers are still unreasonably good. This is not a very helpful graph. Um, it's just saying we've solved more problems. We've made a lot of advances in the last couple of decades. The number of, like the size of formula we can solve are enormous now. Um, we can practically, we can do some reasonably large scale program verification with our SAT solvers. So they are unreasonably good. Probably your takeaway from this bit, by the way, is that if you have a problem that is in NP, don't bother writing your own algorithm for it, just translate it into SAT and use someone else's. But uh, it's all meaningless unless we have some actual problems that we can express as SAT, solve, as SAT formula. So um, this is one. Are these two code fragments the same? Uh, votes, hands up if you think they're not the same. Hands up if you think they're the same. Hands up if you don't care if they're the same. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> hands up if you just don't know. <laughs> um, I'm actually, I'm pretty impressed with the people that could process fast enough. They are the same. Um, but we can write we can write this as like the problem of are these two code fragments the same as a propositional formula. Um, and what we want to do first is we want to so uh, A and B um, are booleans, and we can without 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 it affecting the correctness of our result, we can take H, G, and F, and we can just make those we can just make those booleans. Um, it doesn't matter 
what it, at this point we can just make those booleans and we can then give up we can then write this formula where so we write a propositional formula for the function on the left and then one for the function on the right and then we say does the function on the left always imply the function on the right and and is the opposite true the function on the right always implies the function on the left um and then what we could do is we could check whether this formula is valid um I've already said that we don't generally check whether formula are valid. Uh, that's because checking whether a formula is valid means you have to check all possible inputs. So what we could actually do is we could actually look for what we call a counterexample. Um, so we want to check whether, so if we're looking for a counterexample, we want to find an input that would mean that our, the question we're trying to answer are these two the same is incorrect. So we want to say, find an input that shows me they are not the same. Uh, and that means we want to use an exclusive or. So I've basically negated the formula at the top. Um, quick caveat, I do not guarantee that any of my slides are mistake free. Um, if you find typos in my slides, uh, maybe make an issue on the GitHub. Even better, file a pull request. So that's an example of a propositional formula. Uh, I'm going to give you another example. Um, allocating professors to rooms. I used to be a university administrator before I started my PhD. Um, so let's suppose that we've allowed the professors to have opinions on the rooms that they're in, um, which you should never do. Uh, so Dr. A hates everyone except Dr. B. So he only wants to be next door to Dr. B. Um, and Professor D, who is a bit of a, I mean, he's clearly not very nice. He only wants to be neighbors with other professors. And we've got five rooms. So this is a proposition, this is a this is a propositional sat question. The question is: can we find an allocation to, to their rooms? And this is this is trivially sat. We didn't need to do anything, we didn't need to run an algorithm to find this. We can just we can basically just take. We can run through our constraints, which are that Dr. A needs to be next to Dr. B and Professor D needs to be next to both of the other professors. Have I got this wrong? Yeah. Oh no. Oh no, I have, haven't I? Oh no. Okay, it is satisfiable, but I got it wrong. <laughs> well, yes. That is true. If I put it in the order of the alphabet, it would have been correct. I think what happened here was I think I originally said Professor C was the one that only wanted to be neighbors with other professors. And then I realized that there was like a sort of nominative determinism that was possible with surnames. And it was better to use Professor D because it was slightly politer. Um, <laughs> we can also have, we can also have um, trivially unsat cases. Uh, so obviously this one's unsat because we've got five professors and four rooms. Uh, so we know that's unsat. And uh, Dr. Dr. A is having an off day. He now hates everyone. He's he's off to one side. Um, so this becomes this becomes unsat as well because he can't have a he can't have an office by himself. Um, so you might have noticed this is the pigeonhole problem, except we've let the pigeons have opinions. <laughs> And there are definitely cases where this gets tricky to solve and we can't just solve it just by looking at it. Um, so there is a good reason to encode this as a propositional formula and to deploy a SAT solver on it, unless you just decide that pigeons aren't allowed opinion, opinions, which I think is probably the right thing to do. Um, but let's suppose we let the pigeons have opinions. Um, so, I want to encode this as a formula. So let A1 to N be a set of, yeah. Oh, I'm also adding the requirement that uh, two professors won't share an office. Okay. I just assumed that that was, that's, that's the default opinion okay. of all of the professors. <laughs> I will not share an office okay. um, and the pigeons, obviously. Uh, yeah, so we have a set of academics, A, and we have a set of officers, R, and I'm also going to have E, which is a set of pairs of academics which refuse to be office neighbours with each other. And the problem is find an allocation of officers so that all the academics are happy. 
I mean, like happy with respect to their office allocation, not happy generally. Um, like general happiness might be unsatisfiable. Who knows? So, uh, the formula I am going to write for this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new variable that is true. So I'm going to create this set of variables, x, i, j, where x, i, j is true if academic i is allocated to office j. And then, yeah, as you, as you pointed out, my, one of my requirements is, so every academic must be allocated at least one office, but no more than one. So my first formula is like for all i j, like there must for all for all i at least one i j must be true. So we get at least one office. For the no more than one, I'm putting in this implication. So this implication is if x i j is true, then that means that for all other x i something they must be false. So if academic one is in office one, then X one one is true, but X one two, X one three, X one four, and so on must all be false. And finally, I can add this, I can add this set of constraints um, that uh, account for our pigeon's opinions. Um, and there I'm essentially just saying that these, these academics have said that we don't want to be in neighboring offices. Um, I'm assuming here, by the way, that the officers are like in order, like the numbers mean they're next door to each other. So, yeah, my university administrator, who has foolishly allowed the academics to have opinions, now has a convenient solution to their room allocation problem, which is come up with this formula and give it to a SAT solver. Uh, but question then is, well, okay, there are several questions we need to answer. The first one is, well, what is the SAT solver going to do to solve this? The second one is, well, I can't give SAT solvers LaTeX formula, can I? Um, you can't. We need to know what input you're giving to the SAT solvers. And I guess the third one is, where do I get a SAT solver and how do I run it? Um, so... I'm not really going to tell you how SAT solvers solve propositional SAT in detail. Essentially, all modern SAT solvers use this algorithm called conflict-driven clause learning. The idea is we start at the, so we have this Boolean formula, we start at the decide block, we decide an assignment to a variable, then we go to our BCP, which is Boolean constraint propagation, and we propagate forward any consequences of assigning to that variable. Uh, so, for example, if we've set um, academic one, office one to be true, we then know that um, academic one, office two must be false and so on. If we hit a conflict whilst we're doing that, like if we hit, if we, if we get to the point where our propagation won't work because we've already put another academic in, in, I don't know, we've already put academic one in office two, so one, two is already true. Uh, we then have to analyze that conflict and we have to do some backtracking and we have to go back and we have to reverse the decision we made that caused us to hit that conflict. And we put a clause that says, don't do that again. And then we then we go again. We decide a we decide a new we decide we do some more Boolean constraint propagation, and then eventually we get back round and we get to a Boolean constraint propagation that didn't hit any conflicts, and then we can go back and we decide a new variable, and we keep doing that until we've assigned a value to all of the variables. If you would like to know in more detail how CDCL works. Um, I would suggest the Decision Procedures book by Strickman and Croning. I will put the title of this on the GitHub. And if I can get permission, I will put the chapter on SAT solving on the GitHub. Uh, I suspect I probably can get permission because I did this for my course I was teaching at Edinburgh this year. Um, yeah. So... I don't think I'm going to ask if anyone has questions. If you have questions about this that you want answering, let's talk about it over lunch rather than talking about it in, in the lecture. Um, 
Oh yeah, 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 fine. Let's use Zulip. I will create a thread on Zulip. Does that sound like a good thing to do? You can also, well, I'll create a thread on Zulip for questions as well. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, direct questions to me at lunch or over Zulip. But assuming that someone else has built a SAT solver for us, and we don't need to understand the inners like overly well, we still need to know how to interface to that set solver. So uh, the first thing is that the formula needs to be in CNF. So that's conjunctive normal form. That is the formula needs to be a conjunction of disjunctions. I said I wasn't gonna write. Uh, raise your hand if you haven't seen CNF before. Or even better, no, let's do this the other way around. Raise your hand if you have seen CNF before. Okay. Um, I won't put up CNF. Um, again, questions on Zulip. Um, you're going to see some CNF later on. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is we need to take our CNF formula and we need to write it in this input format called Dimax. But, oh, handy, I did have a definition of CNF. I've forgotten that. It's been a while since I made these slides. Um, yeah, so CNF, disjunction of literal. Um, so, yeah, so we need to have, we need to have, and that's, that's actually incorrect, it should be a disjunction of clauses. Um, yeah, a CNF formula is, so a clause is a disjunction of literals, and a CNF formula is a conjunction of clauses. So, have I gotten on the next page? If we had a formula, that and then we have we have these disjunctions and in here we can have we can have x or we can have not x how do we get to see uh we use sites and transformations um, we don't actually need to use sites and transformations to get to CNF. You can get to CNF without using this. Um, but if you, so you can get to CNF just by applying some basic sort of rules about logic, uh, but you might end up with an exponential blow up in the size of the formula. So uh, the reason we use sites in is because you end up, so you end up increasing the number of variables you introduce a new variable for every um, for every subformula, um, but you don't end up spending. So you can do it in linear time. You can also do it in linear space. I'm going to do an example of this. Um, so the way, if I was to do this by hand. I would make sure I had these transformation rules for some basic operators available. So what these transformation rules say is that, so here, so P is the variables you're introducing. So if you had the subformula not A and you introduce P, you want to introduce P that implies not A, um, you then want to rewrite the CNF and the CNF is on the right hand side because you want everything to end up in CNF. Um, equally, if you have A and B, you introduce a P and you want to introduce P such that A and B implies P and P implies A and B, and then you need to translate that formula into CNF. Um, and then your, your end formula is a conjunction of these. I'm going to step through an example, which hopefully makes this clearer. I'm also going to give you some warning that we don't generally do this by hand anyway. Um, so we're doing this because it's good to know. Um, I can't remember the last time I did one of these by hand apart from to make these slides. So if we take phi here, um, this is not in CNF. Our subformula are not S, P and Q and, oh, P or Q and P or Q and R and the whole thing. So. I've split it into these subformula and I'm going to introduce these fresh variables for each subformula. 
So I'm introducing an X1, which is equivalent to not S and so on for all of these subformula. My final formula is equisatisfiable with um, this. So phi is equisatisfiable with T phi, which is the conjunction of all of these of all of these substitutions. And I can then apply the transformation rules that I have above to convert all of these. So I can apply the transformation rules to convert instead of X, instead of instead of X implies not S and not S implies X1, I can apply the transformation rules to make all of these, all of these bits in parentheses be in CNF. And then if I have the conjunction of CNF formulas, I've still got a CNF formula. Then I can simplify it. Um, maybe you should check this. This might be the point. This might be one of the points where I've made, as well as the as well as the pigeons with opinions. This might be a point where I've made a mistake in my slides. Once we've got a formula in CNF, we're going to write it in DIMAX. Um, this is just a format that all SAT solvers take in. So. Um, if you have a CNF formula, you want to write a file which initially says P CNF number of variables, number of clauses. So here I have four variables, P, Q, R, and S, and I have two clauses. And then each clause goes on a line and there's a zero that says that was the end of the clause. And if your variable is negated, then you put a minus before it. And if it's not negated, you don't put a minus before it. So minus one, minus three, minus four, zero says, add a clause to my formula that is not the first variable or not the, set, not the third variable or not the fourth variable. And then you can think of the zero as being like an and, and then you move on to the next clause. Um, if we had, so if, if we had a, if P wasn't negated in the first clause, it would just be one minus three minus four. Uh, it's, yeah, so. If I want to encode my pigeons with opinions as Dimax, um, because we don't have all day, I've got rid of some pigeons. And I've also not allowed them to have opinions. Um, so now we've just got two professors and two rooms. And my formula has now become either, so X11 or X12. So that says Professor One has a room. Um, does this have a laser on? I do have a laser. Okay, Professor Two has a room. And if Professor One is in room one, then he's not in room two. And if Professor one is in room two, he's not in room one, and so on. And we can convert this to CNF. Actually, we can convert this to CNF without using without using Cyton. Um, please tell me if I've made mistakes in this. Um, I think this is the CNF equivalent of the formula above. We can then we can then write the Dimax and. Let me see. Okay, let's make this big enough so everyone can see. Okay. Uh, so do I have a Dimax for, yeah, okay. So this was example two and it's sat. Here is our allocation to our room. Um, so we have variable one is true, and variable three is true. Um, so I think, think that is correct. I think that means that we've got a professor in each room and we don't have two professors in the same room. Um, you can find these examples on the GitHub. I ran this with Z3, which is an SMT solver, but it exposes its internal SAT solver to you. And it's easy to install, which is why I ran it with Z3. Um, yeah. So. Why is that four? Uh, oh, four is the total. So you say the total number of variables and then the total number of clauses. 
Um, so you've actually, so this is, you've got two variables in each clause here, but you've got four total variables. Zero. Yeah, zero is a terminator. Zero says this is the end of the clause. Now we're going to go on to the next clause. Yeah, yeah. Your clauses can be any length. Um, and the, yeah, the only rule, it, like think of zero as end of line and it's a clause per line. Um, I don't know why this was the format chosen. It just is. Yeah, question. Okay. Second disjunct each of the last four conjuncts. Second disjunct each of the last four conjuncts has a spurious negation. Now you may well be right. I may well have failed to convert A implies B correctly. Um, I don't know. That's, that's, I, that's correct, right? A implies B becomes not A or B, not a or B right? But B was, a, B was negated already. Um, yeah, okay, so we would also have a whole bunch of um, opinions that we could add to this, and we could add a whole bunch of um, professors and rooms to this. Um, but you might have noticed that this is a bit tedious to do by hand. Why is she telling us that stats are these amazing practical things if it takes this long to tell that if we've got two professors, we can put them in two rooms? No one does this by hand. Uh, we're doing this by hand for fun. Um, what do we do instead? We use tools. Uh, there are many tools that will generate SAT and SMT formula for you. Uh, I am going to tell you about CBMC. I am going to suggest, though, that we take a five minute break at this point. I will start again at 12. Uh, this is your opportunity to stand up, walk around, go to the loo. I don't know. Temporary pause, but it's only five minutes. I asked Pete if she drink some batteries in case it died because of the battery. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. It's fine. I can use this. I'll sort it out. Are you sure? I think it might have just lost its. I think it might have lost its attention. Oh, no, it's I think it. So Zoom did something, and I think it lost its focus on that window. Okay. Uh, but now it works. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, Philip. No, I no worries. Died because, but then Elizabeth wanted the um, laser. Yeah, that that should mean How that the battery is up. Anyway, yeah, so, uh, if we lose my controller or we. Yes. Yes. I, I'm, just, I'm not sure what sort of battery it takes. Looks like three triple A's probably. Yes. And probably okay, I have some I have some triple A's, so no okay. Yeah, yeah, now it's probably less possible. I noticed that as I was putting it up, but I think it was twenty-one and two in the same room. I think my main not to bad is the main thing that I know. Yeah, I don't know. Fun task to figure out why yeah. it put the two of the best in the same room. Where is the top of the control? Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, Catherine wants to the, drop up the message yeah. and the uh, okay. and whatever to, uh, yeah. to the guy that has COVID. Uh, worst case, uh, yeah, worst uh, case is always uh, going to be uh, a uh, hate, but you want to there are I, I think we're right? basically like, done. There's so like, you may find there's one guy who missed his flight yesterday and he'll arrive today in the but evening. But there is no algorithm. Hopefully. Um, um, so, yeah, yeah, I think there's like two people left. Not yeah, I guess there are there would be restricted yeah, so cases of sand where you can have I, I think there are uh, you know but the, 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 the thing is that we don't want to the account magic which is not the same. Yeah, like it's not just the uh yeah. I mean, my jet like sat, although it is in VW, it's never something that if I'm running sat as well, it's not a thing that I worry about. Like, it's not usually, like, usually it is far better than. By the way, have you heard of the loss of the Yes. Okay, so, uh, with the machinery with flat tires, that's what you call the 
So I think it's okay. Yeah. I'm not totally familiar with that, but okay. Um, yeah. Um, so are you a PhD student? Well, I'll be good. Okay, also at Harvard. No, no, I bet you didn't hurt her. It was the biggest thing. Have you heard of the story? I've heard of the best 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 of Okay. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I, I've heard that there are some type theory people. Many that, type theory people. That are really cute. Is that from James? Uh, I mean, to, I guess you should talk to Ohad, and Ohad will point you to the people that are most. Ohad, oh. Ohad is sitting yeah, in the front. Yeah, Ohad will point you to the people most relevant to your reference. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit of an outlier. I understand. In, but, uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure how much I'm going to manage to cover. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm going to manage to cover. I may have to skip some things. Yeah. Uh, Right. Okay, I'm going to start in like 20 seconds or however long it takes people to sit down. Uh, right, cool. Uh, so, CBMC. Um, this is a bounded model checker for C programs. I don't really know what the background is here. How many people are, how many people have heard of bounded model checking? How many people, okay, some, how many people could describe to me how a bounded model checker works if I asked? Fewer. Okay, fine, cool, thank you. That gives me, that gives me an idea. Um, so CBMC is a bounded model checker for C programs. I'm going to briefly tell you what bounded model checking is in a second. But essentially, it will... So you put assertions in code, and it will produce a SAT formula. And the SAT formula is equivalent to all possible paths through the program that lead to a violation of that assertion. So any assignment to that SAT formula will give you a path through the program, like a valid path through the program that violates that assertion. And then it, so it builds this formula and then it asks a SAT solver for an assignment. The reason I'm telling you about CBMC, apart from the fact that it comes from Oxford and I did my PhD in Oxford and I've used it so I know how to use it, is because it is, I would say one of the, maybe the most, it's certainly one of the most industrially used verification tools. So it's been used in a couple of automotive companies. So I've listed Toyota here. There was another one that I've forgotten, um, but it has been, so it's used by Amazon Web Services um, massively. And yeah, if you had a C program that you wanted to run, you wanted to run bounded model checking on, CBMC would be, the one that is most likely to work out the box. Uh, now I'm going backwards. Okay, right. So how does CBMC work? Um, this isn't enough information for you to really know how it works, but it passes in your C file 
it builds a parse tree of your C file. Then it builds a control flow graph of your C file. If you want to know how any of those stats work, go and find a compiler's researcher. Um, once you have your control flow graph, it unwinds your control flow graph to a certain bound. You have to tell it the bound in advance um, if you have anything. So it unwinds all of, because you have loops in there and otherwise like you need to produce a single line formula. So you have to unwind these loops to a fixed, to a fixed length. Um, and you basically have to tell it the length unless all of your loops are very clearly bounded. Like if you've got for, if you've got like for I in range one to 10, then it can probably handle it. But otherwise you're gonna have to tell it how far to unwind it. Uh, and once it's got this formula, it will either flatten it into CNS and give it to a SAT solver, or it will give it to an SMT solver. By default, it gives it to a SAT solver. In general, giving it to a SAT solver is at the moment quicker because the internals of CBMC have been very highly tuned. If you were building it now, you'd probably not bother doing that and you'd probably give it to an SMT solver. Why do I keep going backwards? Okay, yeah, so uh, bounded model checking is not sound, um, but it does work. Um, which is why I like it, but possibly why you might find that it, you know, you might find it unsatisfying if you're expecting sound and complete. It's not sound because you have to unwind it to a finite bound. Uh, but, okay, let's look at an example of how CBMC would produce a formula from this program. So this is a straight line program. And because I wanted something I could do by hand. And essentially we're looking for paths through any path through the program that violates this assertion at the end. Uh, spot the mistakes. What mistakes have I made? Uh, I don't think I've made mistakes, but this is good to check. So you've, it's created, um, some so it's created some for, like first line says these are my initial initial assignments. Uh, the next line is the if x then assign z to be y minus one and otherwise leave it as what it was. The next line is if x wasn't true, then you should assign w to be zero you should assign w to be y plus one otherwise w stays what it as it was and then the final two lines are the conjunction that says have you violated my assertion so the assertion is violated if z is not equal to seven well that should be an or shouldn't it or no, if Z is not equal to seven and W is not equal to nine. So I think that is correct. Yeah, you're going to point out where I'm wrong. Oh, oh I disappointing. Okay, okay. So uh, in the matrix unwinding sound, uh, if the single error sign has the total outcomes one line, so uh, it's infinite time. Uh, I don't know if it's the same thing, but I think what you've described is determining a completeness threshold for how far you need to unwind the program. You can determine, so bounded model checking is sound if you can determine the completeness threshold for how far you need to unwind it to cover all program behaviors. And in some cases you can do that, but not in all. Okay, um, so in fact, you can still do that. Okay, I really want to yeah, in practice, you can say that bounded model checking is sound if the thing you are bounded model checking is something you can determine the completeness threshold for. But you may not always be able to do that, um, see the halting problem. Um, yeah. Uh, this obviously is sound because there's no loops. Yeah, question. Yes, I have a question about this embedding because uh, on the program side, the value of Z before and after the assignment is different, right? You have a much of sequence. And on the SMT formula side, how does that get involved? I mean, the two Z that we see are not the same, right? Uh, you, yes. Uh, 
good mistake spotting. Uh, so what we would actually have to do for this is we would have to introduce um, a single static assignment. So we would have to introduce additional variables um, which tell you, so we would have to have, so for every time you assign to, every time you assign to a variable, you have to introduce a new variable that represents it. So what we should actually have is we should actually have um, Z1 and Z2 and W1 and W2, or we should skip the initial conditions. Um, I know why this happened, you know. I actually had this correct before. I didn't have initial conditions on it before. Um, yes. I wasn't going to tell you about single static assignments. Um, okay. This example is probably in the GitHub. And you can probably run CBMC on it. And it will probably tell you that that assertion can't be violated. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good point. Sound and complete depend on the community you're in, like the meanings of them. So it would be better if I said no missed bugs and no false alarms. So when I'm saying sound, what I mean is no missed bugs. And when I'm saying complete, what I mean is no false alarms, but perhaps that's, let's stick with no missed bugs and no false alarms because it depends on the community you talk to. So this will, this, this will have no missed bugs. And if you know the completeness threshold, you will have no missed bugs. Um, no false alarms is dependent on the abstractions you make when you're encoding it. Uh, is, that, that, is that clear? Yeah. Um, going backwards again. Can I ask a question about X? What do you consider X to be here? Is it an input or an unknown? Oh, it's a Boolean value. It? it is a Boolean. I have considered to this. I have considered this to be non-deterministic. Um, which could be a user input. This could be uh, this could be a global that we haven't assigned to. It probably would have been better if I said if I said bool x equals non debt and then not told you what, not given you a definition for the function non debt. Um, this is very like you off. You often have to do things like this when you're verifying programs because you don't know the user inputs or because you want to, you need to start your verification midway through. You want to start your like you can't you can't run the entire program. So you start midway through and say this is non debt, um, which is what SAT solvers are particularly good at finding these finding assignments to non debt that are risky. Okay, so what about the equality test? on the right hand side of the second and third level. Uh, I think it practiced to the right. Oh I see, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. This is the this is if and else notation. Um yeah, sorry. Um yeah that's not that's not clear, sorry. Uh, I'm going backwards again. This is going to keep happening. Um, okay, uh, so I we can also write this in CBMC. Here it is. This one was a lot easier, actually. Um, so uh, this is so I've written function. I've written function one. I've written function two. I've created these variables and I've said make them non debt. Um, so here, this is this is what I meant with the non debt. If you and actually, these are global, so they would be initialized non-deterministically anyway. But if you had the, if these were locals, you would just be like, oh, these are the result of a function that I'm not telling you. And CBMC would be like, oh, that's a non-deterministic variable. Can't tell what it is, won't give it an assignment. And it will run on, oh, I should see prove it should all be capitals. Yeah, so if you run this file, you should get, you should get the result that says, this assertion, these are the same. So, uh, which example was this? Example one. Uh, 
Let's fix that typo. Here we are. Verification success. Check equivalent success. The, the functions were, were equivalent. Well done to everybody that could figure that out without CBMC. Uh, right. So. Uh, this, that was a really simple example, but there are much harder ones. Um, and indulge me a bit while I tell you about some stuff that I've done that I think is cool. Like act appropriately wowed afterwards, please. Um, so if you, what one thing you can use CBMC and therefore SAT solvers for is determining reachability. And if you can determine reachability, you can determine whether you can reach a security vulnerability. And that's what we did with the Zen hypervisor, which, yeah. So the problem here, the problem here is that systems have layers of security. Most bugs are not critical security issues. Uh, so you want to determine which ones are reachable to determine how severe they are. And determining reachability is difficult, right? Like that's, a, that's hard. If I ask you whether a point in a program is reachable, it's really hard for you to tell me, especially when it's like the kind of weird security vulnerabilities that involve like tweaking bit vector values. Uh, yeah, so most like all good systems have these layers and we need to determine whether we can reach our bug from behind, the, whether our bug can reach like sensitive information from behind these layers. And so the full talk on this is on YouTube if you're so excited about this, but essentially you can use model checking to do this and you can use CBMC to do this. Um, and this is this is a proper this is a proper big example of what SAT can do. So Zen is a hypervisor, which is so it creates and runs virtual machines. You can think of this as being like VirtualBox. Um, it's not quite like VirtualBox, but think of it as like that. And it runs some of the Elastic Compute Cloud servers. So when you're using when you're using EC2, it looks to you like you have one machine. It is Zen that is partitioning one server underneath underneath what you're using. Um, so it matters. It's it's very important software. Um, and if you discover a bug in it. Um, if you're a responsible person, you disclose it to the Zen project and the Zen project then go and tell people in the Zen project about this bug. Um, and they find out about it before the public finds out about it. And then they have to decide what to do about it. Um, so you get this, you get this sort of text description that says, hey, there's a bug. This is what it looks like. Um, and like, this is how it's triggered. And then you need to find out whether it is, if you're running a custom version of Zen, you need to find out if it matters to you, if it's reach, if it's a reachable vulnerability or not, and where it can be reached from. Um, these are public. Oh, whoa, that is a bad graphic. These are public. Um, you can look this up. I don't know why that. I don't know why that text policy's got so bad. Um, uh, okay, this computer wants to be wants its McCarthy scan to start. I do not want that to happen. Um, yeah. So if you have once you know this vulnerability is there. If it's urgent, like if you're, if there aren't many layers of security between the, the between the vulnerability and any outside, between between sensitive information and an outside attacker as a result of this bug, then you need to wake up the developer. You might get this in the middle of the night. You need to go and wake someone up, um, and you need them to fix it. If there are still loads of layers, it's not time critical. Everyone can stay in bed and they can do it on their working hours. Um, and hopefully, you're only waking one developer up. Um, but it's possible that you're waking like entire teams up. Um, there could be a lot of them, like Amazon has some big engineering teams and a lot of things that depend on bits of their code. <laughs> also, all Amazon engineers sleep next to each other under an Amazon colored blanket. That's what happens when you join the company. Um, <laughs> So yeah, essentially you want to be able to find out how many layers of security you compromise and you want to do this with reachability. Um, what's the alternative to doing this with a SAT solver? 
you just have to think about it really hard. Um, like if we're not going to do it with a SAT solver, you're going to need an expert who's going to have to come up with a security test that determines this reachability. Um, which is fine. I would always, like if I had one of those experts, like if I had a lot of those experts, then I might just use those experts, but those experts are really expensive and also quite rare. Um, and they probably have to think about it for a while as well. Like sometimes it takes them hours, sometimes like sometimes it takes them days. Like honestly, this can take a really long time, even with super experts. So we can instead use SAT based bounded model checking. Um, and am I going backwards? Yeah. Okay. So to use SAT based bounded model checking, we're going to use CBMC and we're just going to put an assertion in like this. So we can determine these assertions from the, from the text description. And so here it says the operand size is always eight or 16. Um, if I haven't covered up the rest of the text, you'd be able to see that that is key to being able to tri trigger the vulnerability. And quite a lot of these give you these simple assertions. Um, it's surprising. Quite a lot of these text descriptions allow you to write something like this. And then once you've done this, you can run CBMC on it. It's great. Um, there are a bunch of caveats on that. Um, I'm going to tell you the caveats, and then I'm going to tell you that if you want to really know the caveats, you're going to have to read the paper on this. Um, but the caveats on this are that we had to do some stuff to CBMC to make it scale properly. Um, we had to we had to do some abstraction to CBMC and to Zen to make this scale properly. Um, but this is an example of this is a good example of like a research problem where you can model it with SAT and deploy SAT. Uh, yeah, so my takeaways for SAS, surprisingly good, even though your problems are in NP. If you have one of those problems, don't solve it yourself, translate it into SAT, and don't do the translation yourself, use a tool. I have 25 minutes in which I'm going to tell you about SMT. And then we're going to do examples of applying SMT to various things tomorrow. Um, we said lunch at 12.45, right? Okay, awesome. That means I can tell you about SMT. So SMT, like propositional SAT, except now we have theories. Um, and yeah, so we have, Let's for now assume a quantifier free fragment of a first order theory T. So we have propositional connectives. We have a set of additional functions and predicate symbols that come from the theory. And this is the signature of the theory. And then we determine whether these formula are T valid, T satisfiable or T unsatisfiable. So all this means, so it's the same definition as before. Valid is, is always true. Satisfiable is it's true for one assignment. Unsatisfiable is it is never true. And the T bit means that we have used the interpretation of all the symbols from this theory. Uh, so those theories can be things like arrays or bit vectors or floating points or integers. Um, and you can see how the theory can, the theory will affect whether something is like T, T valid or T satisfiable or T unsatisfiable. So for instance, if I'm using bit vectors versus if I'm using integers, it obviously makes a difference because if I have bit vectors, I have this behavior, I have overflow behavior. And if I have proper mathematical integers, I don't have that. For instance, this is in linear integer arithmetic. Um, like the fact that we've used this, we've used greater than, we've used 10 and seven. Integers, that's our theory. Um, how do we solve it? Okay, so you've seen CDCL and I have told you at a very high level how it works. For now, assume that the big red box, that's just a SAT solver, treat it as a black box. Um, essentially, CDCLT is what all modern SMT solvers are based on. And we tag a theory solver underneath our SAT solver. And the first thing we do when we have a formula is we make a Boolean skeleton. So, oh, I'm sorry, I've just broken your board rubber. Here 
if I had the formula x greater than 10 and y greater than 1, my Boolean skeleton, I would take anything that belongs in a theory and I would make a new Boolean variable for it. So I'd be like, oh, okay, this belongs in a theory. Let's make a Boolean B1 for this. This, this is a theory thing that my stats level can't reason about. Let's make a Boolean B2 for this. And then let's give my SAT solver B1 and B2. So this is now my this is now my skeleton, B1 and B2. So I give that to my black box SAT solver, and my SAT solver will tell me if that is satisfiable or not. Uh, so an instance of when I might get, so this obviously, obviously this is satisfiable for the SAT solver, but I could. I could have had, um, sorry, the copy thing's gone now. I could have had this. Um, I don't know why I'd have it, but I could have, I could have something like this, where actually, um, actually my formula becomes not, not B1 and B1 and B2. Like I could have, I could have repetitions of these, of these like theory blocks, and I could have them negated. Um, so you can get cases where the skeleton is unsatisfiable. If the skeleton is unsatisfiable, then obviously the actual thing is unsatisfiable and we're done. If the skeleton is sat, what we then need to do is we need to check with the theory solver. Um, so we would then give this, so we'd give our skeleton to the theory solver and the theory solver would need to check the assignment works with the theory. So our assignment here is true and true. So it would need to check that we can have x greater than 10 be true and y greater than 1 be true. And it would need to give us an assignment to x and y that makes them true if possible. Question. Uh, okay, the question is how does it work if, how did I know this was not B1? Um, would it have worked if this was X greater than five plus five? Um, the answer is it wouldn't, it, it probably wouldn't have worked, naively it wouldn't have worked if this was five plus five, unless I had a simplifier that I ran beforehand. Um, your propositional skeleton can contain negations and ors and implication. So anything that isn't one of anything that is one of those gets kept in your skeleton, and anything that isn't gets turned into turned into a, a boolean, um, yeah, a new boolean. What? So the simplifier would not be inside the theory solver, right? Uh, you could run a simplifier. So your SMT solver could have a simplifier that it runs before it does any CDCL, and that simplifier would be theory dependent. Um, but yeah, your mature SMT solver will run a simplifier first and probably at many points throughout the solving as well. Does the theory solver depend on the theory of greater than? Right? So in this case, we're using a programming language where greater than and plus and so on are filled in, so the compiler actually knows the semantics of plus and greater than and so on. And so it gives this SMT solver information about what these symbols mean, but what if they were user defined? Uh, your theory solver is specific to the theory, which tells you the meaning of the symbols. So in this case, we would be using the theory of linear integer arithmetic, and we would be using a specific theory solver for linear integer arithmetic, but which is in an input format for theory. Is there an input format for theories? Um, that's a really good question, actually. Uh, there isn't an input format for theories. There are so there is a set num like there's a set number of theories defined in SMT lib, and different SMT solvers support different theories. There isn't a way of you modifying these theories on the fly if you're using an SMT solver. Um, we, yeah, that's quite, 
That's quite mm -hmm. tricky, actually. So this is all very internal. And actually, this separation is probably not quite as separate in, inside a real SMT solver. It would be really nice if you could have an interface to build your own to build your own theory and then put it into a SAT solver. But I guess I guess the thing is, once you're building the theory solver, you're essentially just building the wrapper for the SAT solver anyway. So you're probably just going to interface with the SAT solver. But also, but they really are talking about something. Uh, is theory solving completely separable, separable from SAT solving and so on? Is theory solving completely separable from SAT solving? Can you write a separate theory solver? Uh, can you, you write? There's nothing about what SAT solver does. You can just run the program back. Yeah, they are okay. They are separate. So if you your it's integer, they, built together, but they didn't have to. Be. Uh, they didn't have to be built together. Um, in it, okay, so originally, so prior to CDCLT, SMT solvers tended to be specific to the theories, and then gradually people wanted to combine more and more theories, and then we had CDCLT, and everyone was like, oh, well, actually, we had DPLT before that, but yeah, then we had SMT solvers that are based on this CDCLT thing, and everyone was like, oh, this is, and now all SAT solvers use this, um, because it allows you to combine more theories. Um, but yeah, initially, initially SMT solvers tended to be quite specific to the theory. But the problem is you are almost always going to need the propositional part of it. So my integer arithmetic solver could be simplex, for instance. It could be something really simple that has no way of handling propositional logic. And then you do need to integrate it with a SAT solver. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily the other way around. Do I need to integrate a SAT solver with a theory solver? You never need to do it with a theory solver. No, SAT solvers only SAT solvers only do propositional stuff. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, you can write. Okay, so if you have some SMT problems, you can solve just with a SAT solver. If you have bit vectors, if you have integers, then you can't. But if you have bit vectors or like that, you can you can turn that into a Boolean satisfiability problem just by having a Boolean variable for every for every element of the bit vector. You can't. Okay, there is uh, there is a, a recent paper on encoding integers to bit vectors. The tricky thing there is that you need to have you need to deal with the overflow semantics of the bit vectors that you've turned your proposition that you've generated. Yeah, I was sort of surprised by how good bit blasting for integers was actually. Um, yeah, but yeah, like in general, you don't expect it to be good. I was surprised. There's a recent, there's a very recent paper on this, and I was surprised by their results. Um, also, I have no idea how you would do that for reals. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there tends to be, actually, I don't know how there is an, SM, an SMT solver for reals. D real is very good. I don't know how it works inside. Um, I got I got distracted. I, we diverged. If it's sat, then the theory solver can give you can give you like an answer. Um, if it's unsat, you need to return a clause that blocks the assignment, um, and that prevents the same assignment. And then the sat solver runs again. Um, well, uh, we have an SMT solver. So, as an example, the five plus five would totally get unsat by the by the second run through this, right? Yes, you would hope. Um, it would get unsat eventually. I'm not sure how many iterations it would take. Uh, yeah, so you can combine theories. Um, you combine theories with Nelson Oppen. I'm not going to tell you how that works because we don't have time. Uh, combinations of theories might be undecidable, even if the individual theories are decidable. That's just a fun, surprising result. Um, yeah. It's in the decision procedures book, um, including, I also haven't told you how any of the theory solvers work. Um, there's a selection of them in the decision procedures book.
but I did say I was basically going to tell you how to use these things. Um, the really nice thing about SMT solvers is that they've sort of unified on a standard input format that is now pretty mature. So if you're solving SMT problems, you need to write SMTlib, um, unless you're using a Python API, which exists for specific solvers like Z3. I'm not going to tell you about that because um, it's only, it only works for one solver. Um, so essentially, what you must do in an SMT file, you must set the logic, and there is a sort of standard set of logics you can have, and then you can declare some variables, then you can write some assertions, and then you can say, check whether I'm sat. Um, and you can also say, get the model, please. Uh, so here, I would say, uh, so the logic is linear integer arithmetic. Um, so I've declared a variable A. So you declare everything as functions. Um, and if you want a vary, if you want a nullary function, like A is a nullary function. If you want a variable, what you actually want is a, null a, a nullary function. Um, and yeah, so then I've said a certain that A is greater than 10. Um, and I've also said that um, F A true must be less than 100. Um, and if I run, if I run an SMT solver on this, this is what it gives me. It gives me a definition for A, and um, it also gives me a definition for the function f. Uh, the function f just returns zero for all for all inputs. Um, yeah. Static and dynamic arrays. Uh, I think I'm going to tell you about arrays in a couple of slides time, um, but the short answer is that arrays are a bit weird in SMT and they're not, um, they're not the same as arrays in, pro in C. Um, uh, okay, I'm just going to tell you what arrays are now. Arrays in SMT are more like functions they're more like unin they're more like uninterpreted functions um so they're they're more like a map so they have an index and they have they have an index sort and they have like a content sort and for there is a they have a value for any for any index and they are just the size of the number of different values the index can take so if you have an integer if you have an array where the index is an integer your array is infinite and if you have an array where the index is a bit vector, then your array is the length of the maximum value you can put in the bit vector. So if I have an array that is bit vector, where the index is a bit vector of size one, then my array is length two. Um, but if my array is like an integer, it's infinite. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you want to model like actual programming language arrays, um, you have to model them slightly differently. Yeah. Uh, arrays are actually, the way they've defined arrays, they actually get, um, they become uninterpreted functions, which we can deal with, um, which is quite nice. Um, I haven't got any material on how, on uninterpreted functions, um, but yeah. Like they become, they become in the theory of uninterpretive functions. Uh, when arrays get nasty is when you start putting quantifiers over them and you start saying for all elements in this array, they must be greater than zero or something. Like as soon as you introduce the quantifiers, arrays get really difficult. Mm -hmm. Can we just exit the next one and just model them? Uh, yes, yeah, X, X0 and X1 are just, um, is just what Z3 is generated because it doesn't actually matter what the variable names are for that function. Yeah. Uh, you can declare constants. Constants are syntax sugar for declare for a nullary. Yeah, it's coming up. <laughs> You're preempting my contents. <laughs> um, yeah, so the examples that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about solving Sudokus. Um, we've talked about verifying code with uh, CBMC. Um, you can also spit out SMT from CBMC. 
Um, if I have time, I'm going to talk about verify access policies for S2 buckets at Amazon, which is an actual an actual use of SMT solvers that is, if you use S2 buckets, then something called Zelkova runs and it will tell you if your access policies are like unreasonably permissive. Like, did you mean to make your bucket public to everyone? Um, so this is a real life SMT solvers being deployed. Um, if I have time, that's probably the thing that's gonna go if we run out of time though. Um, and I also want to talk about synthesizing code as, oh, sorry. Yeah. Can it tell you that it doesn't matter what A is? Um, in general, no. In practice, sometimes. So if they get to, if when it's solving, it gets to a point where it's like, oh, this is, I know this is sat without me finding an assignment to A you can ask them to spit out partial models and then they'll only spit out the critical bit of the model or the bit, they'll only split, spit out the bits of the model that they've got to so far. Uh, but by default, they will fill up, they will, they will fill up um, every, every assignment. So I'm just asking, uh, um, you get all of the samples on it. So when there's a failure, you get two. Uh, no, you get, okay, so, when it is unsat, you get nothing. When it is sat, you get an assignment to every to every free variable in your formula. If by default, if it is producing full models, you might get, if you ask it to produce partial models, then it will miss, it will stop when it's got enough assignments to determine that it's sat. And so then you might get a model for F, but not, um, like, I don't know if, if in this case you'd always get something for A, but if you'd if you'd got variables that really didn't matter, then it might not bother giving you a model for them if you ask for partial models. Uh, if you wanted to know if it was valid for all for all cases, you for all A, then you could you could invert the, you could, you could either say this formula needs, you could use a quantifier and you say this formula needs to be valid for all A, or you could invert it and you could check that it's, you could check that there isn't an A for which it's invalid. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay. So we're gonna talk, I'm gonna, should I start Sudoku's now? We've got five minutes. Um, I'll do five minutes of Sudoku. Um, so everyone knows how to solve a Sudoku. Check. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, well, okay, how everyone knows how to check with a Sudoku. Everyone knows what a correct solution to a Sudoku is, what the constraints are for a correct solution to a Sudoku, I hope. Um, here are the constraints. Okay, so all rows and columns must contain the numbers one to nine only once each and each box must contain the numbers one to nine only once each. Um, if you were solving a Sudoku, how would you do it? I, I don't do Sudokus. Um, I find them infuriating because you could just give them to an SMT solver, so I don't know why I'd do them in my spare time. Um, <laughs> You sort of, you sort of like do, you sort of propagate information forwards, right? You look at what the most constrained thing is. You propagate information forwards. Sometimes you reach a, sometimes you reach a conflict, right? Sometimes you realize that some of the assignments you've made didn't work, and then you have to backtrack. So essentially, you're solving Sudoku's like a like a SAT solver, anyway. Um, this is why I am apparently no fun at recreational games. Um, my mother once spent a very long time making. She made this puzzle that was like a poem that contained anagrams and you had to find like anagrams of different bits in the poems and she's clearly spent a lot of time in it and I wrote a bit of code to solve it and then sent her all the answers back and she doesn't send me puzzles anymore. Um, but yeah, I also don't solve Sudokus because I find them, find it pointless to do it by hand. Uh, but I do like doing them with SMT solvers, I guess. Um, so the first thing we would do if we were going, if I'm going to solve the Sudoku problem, so I need some way of declaring this, declaring the grid. 
Um, so I'm going to make the grid an uninterpreted function, where if you give it the X and Y values, like the position, it returns the value. So I'm going to say, this is the function that tells you what the value of the things in the grid are. Um, so functions don't have side effects in s and um, They won't throw, their, and they're total, they're defined on all input values and they don't have exceptions. Um, so not at all like your programming language functions in most cases. Um, I could use nested arrays instead, but this is gross. Like this is really gross. Um, so, and arrays aren't like arrays in C, they're more like functions. So I'm gonna have to start putting constraints on and just like, it's gross. Um, I'd much rather write this with an uninterpreted function. Um, also, when you start using arrays, you have to write, like you have to like selecting and storing are like functions rather than there isn't a nice syntax for it. Um, Oh yeah, if I was using arrays, I could use declare const, which is just sugar for it being nullary. Um, and okay, I wanna say that all of the rows and columns contain the number one to nine. So I'm gonna write something like this. Um, so this, so I'm gonna write this for A11. I'm actually gonna have to do this for all of them, which is, but that's one way of doing it. Um, and I also want to say, uh, they're only contained once each, and I'm going to use distinct to do that. Um, so I'm going to say that um, everything in a row is distinct, and I'm going to do that for all of them. And then I want to put in the constraints for what's actually in my grid. So I want to say, okay, A13 is nine. And then I want to say, check it's satisfiable and give me a model. Uh, let's hope it's satisfiable. Um, Uh, I think I put those in, in, you are correct. Um, I think I put them in, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot, this is, this is a lot. Okay, so that's all my values. This is distinct in my rows, distinct in my rows. Uh, this is distinct in my blocks. So I've used distinct to say that my blocks can only contain one to nine once. And then I've got all the way down here and I've said, oh, okay, now I'm gonna put in the assignments for um, that I've been given. Uh, I'm gonna show you how you can write shorter definitions in a sec. So yeah, okay, so this is what it gives me. So it gives me this, it defines this function, which tells me like, given this input coordinate, so given one, one, the output should be three and so on. I haven't actually checked this is correct. Um, I think it's correct. I hope it's correct. But yeah. Yeah. So what the C vector of the function is going to be the The syntax of the model that comes back is going to define a function for it's going to define a function for um, every free variable. Um, it's not necessarily going to look this nice. Um, so I think if I run a different SMT solver, I'm going to get um, something a bit grosser. Um, oh, also, I didn't tell it to produce the model. It's also going to take a while. Um, yeah, other question whilst that's running. Uh, so, well, I think it's gross. See, sometimes yeah, it's gross. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, the satisfiability check here is going to tell us that there is a solution. Yeah. Uh, but how complex is it to check if that is the only solution, which is what generally Sudoku's want? You want to have one solution to your Sudoku, not multiple, because at then yeah. Um, okay, so checking it's the only solution. Uh, actually, that's quite easy because once we okay, so what we could do to do that, we could run it once, get this solution, then we could assert that solution is the solution, um, and then we could run it again and ask it for if there's a different one. So we could do that with two SMT queries, and the second SMT query isn't any more complicated than the first. 
Um, the tricky thing is finding all solutions because to find all solutions, you essentially have to enumerate through until and do that until it becomes unsat. Um, this is the last thing I'm doing, by the way. So if there are any other questions. Uh, so as in the satisfiability modulo theories? Yeah. Uh, so modulo just means we're doing satisfiability, but we've got this series over attached to it. Okay. Um, so like this is this is satisfiability. This is sat modulo the theory of arrays and integer arithmetic. Uh, yeah, anything else? Yeah. So uh, let's say you have a task Does that mean that the solver needs to enumerate all possible? Uh, uh, not necessarily. Obviously, that would be one way of doing it. Um, but you would hope that the solver would get like the minimum. You'd hope that it would get a set of constraints earlier than that 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 mean that it's unsatisfiable. So, like the case, the simple case of a bad of a bad unsolvable one is one where I don't know the only valid input for a one one is a nine, but there's also a nine de determined by the row and the column, but there's also a nine somewhere in its block. So you'd only need to try. You'd only need to get the constraints for a one one to know that's unset. But worst case, you might have to enumerate all of it. Like it tries to say, like here's like the conflicting plots. That's the answer. Uh, it doesn't give you anything when it's unsat, but some solvers can give you an unsat core. But determining that unsat core is quite uh, difficult. Like usually, it just won't say anything. It'll just be like, no, unsat. Yeah. Are you able to say anything about the theorem proven, like Isabel, that will attach to um, technical theorem proven that will attach to like the theorem proven to get a, a proof of that? Or is that way out of this world? Uh, <laughs> I am not able to say anything meaningful about that. I might see if I can, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll see if I can do a little bit on that tomorrow, maybe. Yeah. Hello. I have a friend who uses constraint programming to solve two plus two. Are they doing the same thing as you, or are they doing something different? Uh, they are probably doing the same thing as me, roughly. So there is a whole field that is like constraint satisfaction programming and like CSP solvers. And it's very sort of overlapping with the world of SMT and SAT. Um, I think, so I think they cover a limited number, like fewer theories than SMT solvers. I, they do have some different algorithms. I'm obviously very biased, but I think, think i think from the most for most applications i think sat solving tends to be more performant um but like there's a lot of overlap in the csp and the sort of sat smt communities um yeah Oh no, I don't actually know what's in the arrays with extensionality versus arrays. Um, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah. Your system, right? Yeah. Okay, so the set solver has to make a yes for every value. Mm -hmm. Right, so maybe I'll just say that x1 is true and then see if I get down there. But when you know it's not just a variable, like, you know it's a solution, you know it's a number, so maybe you just look at all of the rows, if one of them has eight numbers, then you don't have to make a guess, <laughs> you can just put the last number there. And so a constraint or a condition is more clever sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, there must be a constraint solver underneath, no? Well, yeah, our constraint solver is our SAT solver, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess the difference is your constraint solving is typically working it's not doing this thing where we're taking where we're taking the theory, like the full formula and we're abstracting the skeleton. Um, I think they're typically more integrated. If you know, but if you know the problem, if you know more about the problem, you can write more clever constraints. 
Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe is anyone keen enough to write me a CSP formula for solving a Sudoku? We can compare them. Um, okay. I think it's lunchtime. I think if you have more questions, you can ask me over lunch. Cool. Okay. And may I encourage everyone to do everything in four weeks, say three, for example, possible shake sandwiches and send a sandwich lunch and take to the main area. Uh, we have local people, uh, Akira, Mark, and Natalia, and Matthew, if you could raise your hand. Maybe they'll just show you how to take food and to find a nice place because there are a lot of nice sitting areas on campus with nice weather. We all go outside and eat. If you can afford it, please wear a mask. There are plenty of masks at the reception when you come back from the lunch break. Uh, and yeah, enjoy your lunch. And uh, but we're not delaying uh, the next session, so we're coming back at two thirty, I believe it's in the program. Whatever is in the program, we'll come back at the same time. I don't know what it is in the program. Thank 